Hi, I'm, my name is Jim McCormick and formerly with the Ohio Division of Wildlife. I recently retired, but when I was there, I was the author of the Lake Erie Birding Trail Guidebook. And the division and I put that together and it's a comprehensive birding trail of various sites, the length and breadth of Lake Erie on the Ohio shoreline. It covers what are called loops, seven different loops. We're in the Cleveland one right now. And so, a hundred some sites all along the very best birding spots right along Lake Erie shoreline. The reason we focused on Lake Erie is because it's so great for birds. There's about 427 species of birds that have ever been found in Ohio, and over 400 of those have been found right on the shores of Lake Erie. People come here from far and wide, even across the Atlantic Ocean, England, to come bird in Ohio. Today we're standing in the most inland site on the Lake Erie Birding Trail, and that's Cuyahoga Valley National Park, and Blue Hen Falls to be specific. And this is the uh, biggest wooded area in the entire Lake Erie Bird Trail, and it's full in the summertime, especially full of uh, neotropical breeding birds, warblers, uh, wood thrushes, vireos, and songbirds like that. That's its claim to fame. And being as it is so close to Lake Erie, we couldn't resist including it. But most of the sites on the trail are right on the lake proper, uh, including the islands of Lake Erie. Birding trails are a fairly recently phenomenon. To the best of my knowledge, the inaugural birding trail was the Great Texas Birding Trail. And that was started in 1996, if memory serves. So we're talking, you know, 21 years. And they have really mushroomed since then. There are probably, I'm going to guess, several hundred now in North America, elsewhere in the world as well. And Ohio got on the bandwagon 12, 15 years ago with two different trails in southern Ohio, the Lake Erie Birding Trail being the third one that I'm aware of at least, and the biggest and most comprehensive probably by far in terms of sites. The book, there's a really nice Lake Erie guidebook that you can purchase. Just Google Lake Erie Birding Trail and you go right to all this information. And then there's a wonderful accompanying website that goes with the uh, birding trail as well. So if you just Google Lake Erie Birding, Lake Erie Birding Trail, you'll go right to the website. It covers all seven loops of the trail with specific directions to each site, what species you can expect to find, especially noteworthy, rare species directions how to get there, uh, what to expect when you arrive at the site, and tons of photos. I think there are over 400 photos on that website and in the Lake Erie Birding Trail Guidebook. So there's tons of information, uh, especially for those that are not used to Lake Erie or familiar with it. It's a really good way to navigate yourself around and easily find sites. I got interested in birds um, when I was probably five or six. I really don't remember. It was just one of those innate interests that I had ever since I was a little kid. I remember in the fourth grade, kids would, <laughs> other little kids would bring in pictures of birds and cover the name up and try and stump me on what their names were, and I would usually get those. So something triggered this uh, spark uh, of interest in birds when I was just small. And, that led to a career in biology and botany. I spent most of my career with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources as a botanist. Um, and I'm interested in everything, all facets of natural history, but birds are still extremely strong. That's what got me interested in everything to do with nature. And that's true of a lot of people I've found who really are smitten with natural history. And then that led to some other good opportunities. I'm the author of Birding, Birds of Ohio, uh, a guidebook uh, to all the birds of Ohio, and five other books on natural history that I co-authored or on. Um, it's just, I think, a primary interest of mine, though, just to get people interested in nature. Uh, I think we... We, and by we, I mean people like me who are really, really heavily into this, would be remiss if we didn't put some of those abilities we've learned over the years to use trying to get other people interested in nature and natural history. Because conservation is really overarching all of this. We need people to protect the environment. 
and no, at no time in recent history is that probably more true than right now. Uh, so that's what is uh, behind virtually all of these projects ultimately is just driving an interest in people and na nature, whether it's birds or plants or insects, doesn't matter. Yeah, thanks for asking me about photography. That's uh, mushroomed into a huge interest of mine, probably an addiction would be the appropriate word for it, but I got into photography um, fairly on in the digital era. I took uh, photos haphazardly in the film era. I wasn't really heavily into it. It was more for just strict documentary purposes of this or that. Uh, but in 2003, I got my first digital point-and-shoot camera at that time, and that's about when that technology was really starting to come on strong. And uh, so that's been about 14 years ago, and uh, it's just taken off since then. And um, equipment-wise, I'm way beyond that first point-and-shoot. As a matter of fact, Betsy, you met me here because, one, it was convenient, and two, I always wanted to shoot uh, landscape images of Blue Hen Falls, which is really pretty, especially now with this mid-March cold snap. It's about 20 degrees out here, and the waterfalls are frozen largely, so it's very, very showy. Um, but photography and videography are great, great assets to really pique people's interest about nature. Uh, not everyone can go clamber down this steep, snowy slope, or, and this is easy stuff uh, compared to what a lot of people do, um, but this is a way we can bring this back, and people can live vicariously through the photographer, the videographer, and whatever their adventures may be. Uh, it's a wonderful way to bring birds up close to people in a way that they could never see them even through binoculars. Uh, one of the lenses that I shoot birds with is a, uh, I'm a Canon guy, but it's a Canon 800 millimeter. And that really, really has some reach to it. So you can reach out and grab small songbirds or waterfowl, whatever the case may be, a long ways off. You can count every feather on them. And uh, it's just really a grand way to bring nature home in an epic way, in a way that people really can appreciate his art, as long as the photographs are okay, and I would have to say I throw away most of mine, but that's probably true with most people, but there are keepers occasionally. So anyway, <clears throat> to me, photography's just become a way to tell stories and uh, share nature with people. Um, I originally... I, I've been on the speaking circuit a long time. As a matter of fact, tonight, the reason I'm up here is I'm speaking to the Cuyahoga Valley Photographic Society tonight, and the talk that I'm going to give is not a how-to photo talk at all. It's a talk about Ohio's natural history and how interesting and diverse it is using my photography. Because back in the day, I used to have to beg or borrow or even purchase photos to use in my talks because I didn't have them. I didn't like that. I wanted my own stuff, and I wanted to show things in a certain way through my own lenses, my own eyes, and I couldn't, you know, rarely find photos that exactly fit the criteria. So increasingly, I started taking my own images, and now I very, very rarely have to beg, borrow, or read or purchase a photo from anyone else to use in any of these talks. So that's great, but better yet than that, for me at least, is it really, really allows me to interpret in the way that I want to interpret it as I see things in the wild, so to speak. So it's just been a, a wonderful asset uh, for me and many, many others. There's lots and lots of great photographers just in Ohio, we're uh, lucky that way, uh, who use photography as a way to interest more people in natural history. Um, I think anyone who's interested in nature, actually I think everyone in the world, uh, with no exceptions, should be interested in conservation. That's really where all this should lead, all of it. Um, anyone who likes nature will not have any nature if we don't do a good job of conserving what we have and ideally restoring um, things that we've lost. A uh, wonderful example of that in Ohio is prairie. Now, at the time of European settlement, which was only a couple hundred years ago, just a uh, blip in time, uh, you know, geologically speaking, the state was 95% forest, like we're standing in here, 
The other 5%, by and large, was prairie. Ohio was the uh, very west eastern end of the uh, Great Prairie Peninsula that extended on over to the Rockies. And we have lost 99.9% .9 of that prairie. So it's become one of our scarcest resources because uh, we didn't do a good job at protecting what we had. Fortunately, uh, Metro Parks and other organizations like the Ohio DNR have taken to restoring some of this prairie. So that's a good thing, you know. Sometimes you can recover that that has been lost. But uh, the best thing to do is uh, keep it while you can. Don't destroy it and try and restore it. Just protect it. Uh, Cleveland, you know, we're just south of Cleveland, in between Akron and Cleveland right here, is very fortunate in that Cleveland has the Emerald Necklace, and this Cuyahoga Valley National Park would be part of that. And that was visionary. You know, they did protect some of the really gorgeous valleys of the Cuyahoga River and some of the other rivers up here. And people really appreciate it. It's 20 or 21 degrees out here in March, nice cold snowy day. And there's a nonstop stream of people I've observed making this trek back here to Blue Hen Falls. Uh, and you can only imagine what it's like on a nice spring or summer day. So people really, really want these resources to be protected. And so it becomes incumbent upon all of us to do what we can to protect. And an easy way to do that is just join a group, uh, like Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society or uh, any of the local Audubon societies, or especially the Nature Conservancy. I'm a huge fan of TNC because the Nature Conservancy buys land, first and foremost. And to me, that's probably the most important thing. Uh, virtually every cent of a duck stamp goes to on-the-ground land acquisition. You just can't beat that. So that's another simple way to spend 25 bucks a year and uh, make a huge bang for your buck. As a matter of fact, Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge on Lake Erie, one of the most heavily birded spots in the state of Ohio, uh, something like, I don't remember, but 80% of that refuge was acquired through duck stamp dollars. So there's an easy way to do it. But whatever you do, just uh, I think we should always think conservation, how we can help with that, and how we can interest other people uh, in becoming conservationists. What do I think about the future? Um, and by future, you know, I'm sure you mean conservation and natural resources. Uh, the pat answer for someone like me when asked that is to be rosily optimistic and bring out all the signs of hope I see. And there are a lot of those, but um, that wouldn't be totally honest to me to answer that way. And I'm not going to. Um, we have a lot of problems, a lot of problems right now. There's a, uh, well, Richard Liu brought this out in his seminal work, um, Last Child in the Woods, which a lot of people watching this will have read, but um, there's a much greater disinterest, disconnect from nature these days, and that's a real problem because people will not protect what they don't know anything about. Uh, hence all my previous words about getting people out and looking at things in Lake Erie birding trails and all that sort of thing, but um, that's a real issue, and it's one that's not getting better. So we have that, we have a disconnect, we see it in politics right now, where uh, the decision makers, by and large, <clears throat> know nothing about the environment. As a matter of fact, if you just looked at that as a, at a federal level and added up the budgets of the Department of Interior and the EPA, uh, two of the biggest environmental federal agencies, um, they're uh, less than 1% of the entire federal budget. And uh, right now they want to cut the EPA by 20% uh, or so. So that tells you right there the mindset of thinkers. And we are not unique to that. At least we have laws in this country that do go a long ways towards protecting natural resources. A lot of the world doesn't have anything like that. Uh, nor they do they care, but the big gorilla in the room that o should, in my opinion, overarch any rational discussion of conservation is us, Homo sapiens. Um, we're about 8 billion worldwide right now. We hit a billion for the first time, about 1,800 if memory serves. 
uh, once we learned to extract oil and petroleum resources, that spiked tremendously. It shows no sign of really slowing down. It's going to go far beyond $8 billion. Uh, and this is just putting an incredible pressure on all of our natural resources. The short-sighted thought processes of politics do not lend themselves well to the steps that we need to take to really, truly protect Earth's environment. Here in Ohio, everywhere else on the planet.